Welcome to another episode of Raven Conversations. I'm Joe C. Mandel, State Public Affairs Officer for the Washington National Guard. And today I'm joined by Annie DeAndrea. She is the Transition Assistant Specialist over at the Joint Services Support uh, here in Washington. And you're here to talk to us about what you do um, and how guardsmen can use your program to help themselves as they transition out into retirement and even just any service member, really. Absolutely. So. So thanks for joining us, Annie. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure being here today. So quick background yeah. on yourself. Um, so about 16 years ago, and actually we're going to go a little bit further. 17 years ago, VA went to National Guard Bureau and said, you have all of these people deployed. Remember, we were in the heart. It was 2006. So we've had so many service members over there as a state. But as a nation, 50% of the, work, the force over there was National Guard. And they said, you've got all these people deploying, nobody to help them. So the program was invented, the Transition Assistance Advisor Program was invented in order to be that support for them. Mm -hmm. Um, A few years ago, the program kind of changed courses and Washington State decided that they would prefer me to stay in the capacity that I have been in. So they converted me to technician, which means I get to stay. I'm now the Transition Assistance Specialist. And and to kind of give you the, the generic phrase for this. Um, Basically, I I am a VA benefits advisor. Mm -hmm. Any benefit that is available through the VA, my job is to make sure that I clear the roadblocks. So they have easy access um, and everything successful first application out. Now, I would love to tell you I'm a genius. In fact, I kind of really believe VA subject matter experts are kind of like Bigfoot. They've been spotted, but nobody can confirm their existence kind of thing. Um, Every time we learn, the VA changes. Mm -hmm. So it's constant learning. But I come real close to being that expert on how to get a guard claim through. Yeah. Um, 2012, uh, Army Times came out with an article that said that a guard and reserve claim is four times more likely to get denied than an active duty claim or even a veteran's claim. And again, part of the process is because there is not adequate training on all the steps that have to be taken before the claim goes in. So kind of what happens now, especially if you're active duty, is you go sit with the uh, veteran service officer. They say, tell me everything that's wrong with you. They write it down. Claim goes in. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, if you're a member of the Guard and you do that, your claim is going to fail. Okay. There has to be evidence that you were injured while on guard duty. It's kind of the problem when you're only two days a month. Well, you're 28 days a civilian. So how do we prove your two days broke you and not the 28 days as a civilian? Yeah. So it kind of takes a little more evidence to prove military broke you as opposed to your regular life. Yeah. So, so in your capacity, um, I mean, what are those things you, you tackle? It sounds like obviously transitioning yes. and, and VA claims. What are some other things that you, that you take care of or help guardsmen um, with? Well, probably the biggest thing, again, claims is a big part of my job, but I problem solve. If anybody that is guard or reserve has had a failure in that process, been denied, uh, I problem solve that for them. So they come sit down with me. I can tell them exactly why it failed and what we have to do to overturn the failure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then in addition to that, and and again, some, the money is great. We're we're not going to lie. The money is really nice to have with the VA. You know, having a husband that's service connected, the money is really nice. But the big key with this is we want to make sure that as these guys progress in their injuries, the VA will be there to take care of them medically for the rest of their life. Everything service connected, the VA is on the hook to 100% pay for their medical care. So now we're offering them a lifetime of assurance that they're never going to have to worry about not getting care. Mm -hmm. So VA is going to take care of them. And that's the big part about this is that medical piece. And then I work home loans, I work issues within the GI Bill. We have an amazing education department, so I don't work the application process. Um, That's where they come in. But if anybody's having problems, once they're in those programs, then I can problem solve those. Yeah. So so for for anything, right, whether it's GI Bill, home loans, 
uh, VA claims, what do guardsmen need to know? What do they need to bring with them? Uh, probably the biggest thing that they don't understand is they have to. So, and to break this up a little bit on the claim processing or to fix something that a claim that has failed, we have to have their national guard medical file, because I can tell you that's what failed is that didn't go in or didn't go in complete. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's number one. Once we have that, in fact, that's probably the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is come meet with me. We're going to spend up to about two hours going through every page of that medical file because I'm going to look at everything you've ever complained about. You know, I kind of laughed. Um, had a service member that had been experiencing chronic headaches pretty much his entire career. And I looked back through his file. And when he first joined, he was big army out partying with the buddies, went to the front windshield of the car in a car accident. Well, sustained a head injury. Could not remember by the time we'd actually sat and done the claim. Hmm. Had no idea he'd ever had an accident. like. So wow. that's what I'm looking for. Okay. Yeah. Is what, what's kind of hidden in there that we should be bringing to the surface and then work to, in order to make sure we get it connected. Yeah. So, so I think as a, as a <laughs> normal guardsman, um, I've always been in the guard I've, I've deployed, but I was never active duty. Um, what, what can I claim when it comes down to like, great, great you know, question. that retirement? Thank you. That was a great question. Uh, basically if you're in, um, drilling or annual training status, the only thing we can get for you is an injury. Okay, and then I say that with kind of a grain of salt because there's an exception to the rule. If you are having a heart attack or a stroke, and again, the big qualifier here, you do not get in your car and drive yourself home. Mm -hmm. You know, a commander, ambulance, something takes you to the hospital besides you, then you can claim that. But other than that, injuries are really the only thing during that time. You can't say two days a month caused an illness that we know takes months and months. Yeah. So that's kind of how the VA looks at it. But if it is an injury and you have not filed in line of duty for that injury, well, then we're going to have to take extra steps to make sure that we prove it. And that can be the hard thing is proving it. But there are so many ways to do that. You know, that's where you get your commander involved, get him to write a statement saying, yeah, we were, at, you know, doing a, a PFT and he fell and hurt his knee. Mm -hmm. uh, we got proof. Yeah. So, so you also deal with the PAC Act and, and yes. folks claim for that. Can you, can you briefly describe the PAC Act for those that don't know? And then how, you know, how do you become eligible for the, for the benefits that come out of that? Oh, awesome. Yes. Um, it is probably the greatest thing to happen to a National Guard claim ever, uh, ever, ever. So I'm so grateful that we have this opportunity. But basically, if you have been OIFOND, um, one of the places, and again, they expanded the location. So they've included Saudi Arabia and a lot of the other surrounding countries. But for basically for us, for the Guard, it's been Afghanistan, Iraq service. If you've been there now, instead of having so prior, you had to prove as you left theater, that something you were exposed to there, burn pits, the sand, something has caused a medical condition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the PAC Act says you no longer have to prove it happened in theater. If you can prove you have the condition, we will approve it as a presumptive condition for service there. Um, if I can give you an example. Yeah. Tell my husband at the same time. Um, so my husband deployed 2008 and nine with the brigade. Okay. Um, nine years later, developed cancer. Never in a million years would he be approved for the cancer because the VA would not recognize it since it was nine years after his period of active service. Well, thanks to the PACT Act and it being one of the presumptive cancers in that bill, they service connected the fact that he had cancer plus all of the residuals that come with that kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. So that was something that we, we would never ever see. And we were able to put that in and get approval for. Yeah. So you, you kind of alluded to something I was curious about there because you were saying you don't have to apply like right away, right? When you leave theater, you can, it, 
it kind of goes into nine years mm-hmm. later, like with, uh, with Mark, right. he was able to apply for benefit. Um, how does, how does one go about doing that? Right. I mean, especially guardsmen that are out, you know, the, maybe they got out five years ago and now all of a sudden they're developing, uh, conditions. How do they go about, uh, one finding out if, if they're even eligible for it? Right. Right. And, and the key with that, as long as you have a DD-214 that says that you are boots on the ground in one of those countries, that's all you need for proof you were there. Now you only need to go to your primary care physician and get a, get a diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it, it's 13 respiratory conditions and 14 different types of cancers. Okay. Um, probably the most common is chronic sinus inflammation which allergies, which we seem to have regardless because we're in the Pacific Northwest. But um, having that, not having a diagnosis prior, but then having that after visiting those countries, you know, or having a worsening case of it, okay, now you've just proven the PACT Act Mm -hmm. and can get approval for that. It's going to be automatic. They're going to see the diagnosis and say approved. Yeah. Simple. So uh, one uh, kind of a question that I think I've always, I was curious about, and uh, I think I may know the answer. So let's say you're still a drilling guardsman, right? Can you get your guard pay and your VA compensation pay at the same time? Excellent question too. It's probably one of the biggest parts of misinformation that is out on the web right now. You will hear every scenario possible for this And I'm so glad we're talking about this because I have done extensive research and I have worked this now for 16 years. I know what I know what I'm talking about. So I'm hoping that first off people give me, if you don't believe me, come and come and test me. I would be happy to, to challenge that. But the key with this, okay, VA says you cannot have military pay and VA comp for the exact days that you're serving. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please understand days, not months. So people see this and they're like, okay, I have a thousand dollars comp, but I make three hundred dollars for drill, and they're thinking that they make more comp than they do drill. And the fact is, because we're only looking at the days, not the month, mm-hmm. that's where they're going to lose money if they start thinking about, you know, alternatives like shutting off military pay. So it's a day for day. So basically, when somebody is serving, they're entitled to a full year of military pay and 10 months of their compensation. So the average guardsman is gonna do 63 days, Mm -hmm. excuse me, 48 drills and 15 days of annual training. So every year DOD will send a letter saying that, yes, you did your 63 days. So we're proposing, if you agree with the days, we are gonna take six days a month out of your compensation. And for the following year do that, and then you, when you equal the 63 days, we're done, mm-hmm. and you are square for the previous year. Okay. Simple. Yeah. Simple, simple. Now, people are hearing that, um, actually, going through some of the in-processings, that they have to shut one off. And that's not correct. Yeah. They and, do not. And that's, so I'd imagine, like, let's say you're an AGR or full-time active duty, right. you cannot double that's but in the when guard and reserve, it's yes. a little different. It is. It is. And and at that point, and even if you deploy for a year, we're going to want to shut off the comp. And that's something that I can absolutely help with as well. So so let's say your paperwork is wrong, right? Let's say something got lost or as, as many of us know, when you come off deployment, it may not have been identified then. And then it was identified later by a civilian doctor. Mm-hmm. What, what is it that you can do or what do, what do you do to help them with that? Right. So there's a, there's a couple of avenues for support. And probably the biggest one is we can get the VA to arrange a payback. So let's say you didn't shut your comp off and, you know, the spouse found out that you have money in savings and decided to buy a new car. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Now you can't pay it back even. So we can go with the VA to see about modifying payments to make them reasonable enough to where you can afford them. We can go in there and ask them to partially or completely forgive the debt based on the fact that you cannot afford to to pay it back. 
um, a lot that we can do to relieve this, to make it easier on your family. The VA doesn't want to hurt anybody, hurt their budget, nor do they want to create a family into a homeless situation. Mm -hmm. So they will do everything they can to support you as you're going through this, but you just have to know how to turn in the correct paperwork. Yeah. So that's what I do is I can sit down with you and say, look, you know, your budget says you can afford $50 a month. So this is what we're going to send in. And then they'll agree to the 50 a yeah. month. Yeah. So. And, and, and you're so you're, I mean, you're very passionate about taking care of soldiers. Um, and, and I think it's we, we always share, you know, your guard story because it is part of your guard story. Right, right. Mark? Uh, right. Kind of share that story with us about why you, hey. you love the love the National Guard. Hey. Actually, so Mark and I met 25 years ago. He was already, oh my goodness, he, so he joined, he joined the Army in 1978 and then came over to the Guard, I want to say it was 1985, and had been in the Guard. He actually did 36 and a half years total service in the military, long time. Well, he did not marry. He recruited an FRG is what he did. He had me in signing paperwork to be a volunteer with the unit before we were even married. So he immediately involved me and I was hooked from the minute I stepped in when I met the most wonderful people I've ever met in my entire life. I mean, dedicated, honorable they're here for a purpose, and that's to do what's best for our country. I mean, I know I, that sounds kind of cocky, you know, obnoxious, but it is so true. I mean, these are the greatest people on the planet. So I, I was hooked and wanted to be involved. And as the years progressed, job openings happened, um, started out in family, well, started out as a volunteer, a family program volunteer, mm -hmm. And then became paid staff with family programs and then eventually into this position that is totally something that I love to do. You know, I, I understand. Um, I used to be a dump truck driver. So every joint in my body's broken. Every single one, unfortunately. Um, having gone through the state process, I understand how easy things are to get goofed. Yeah. And I don't want to see anybody have that experience with the VA. Because this is, this is the rest of your life benefit. It has to go well. Yeah. So I get passion for that. Plus, I've been through the gambit of everything. I've seen my husband go through it all, the changes that he's gone through. And it's, it's not easy kind of being on the outside sometimes looking in and getting frustrated because there's things that I can't do to help him. And so being passionate about making sure there's people there that can do that is really important to me. Yeah. yeah. So how do how do folks get a hold of you? Um, very badly. So unfortunately, <laughs> um, I am the only one that is here supporting the Air and Army National Guard. Plus, so you know, um, as far as I know, in talking with the other transition assistance specialists around the nation, um, last count there was five of us. And out of the five, I am the only one doing claims processing for the Guard. So I literally get calls from all over the nation, um, mass emails. So email is the best way to get me, but you can leave me a message on my phone. Please understand with the client, I can't stop what I'm doing with the client to answer a phone call. So yeah. um, I will get back to you eventually. Yeah. So do my best, but it's not, it's not something that's intentional it's I'm really trying to help as many people as I can. So be patient with me. Yeah, we can definitely put your info in the notes. Yeah, for, would you please? Yes. Uh, it, really, anything you want to add? Um, seriously, because you're going to hear things like don't ever file for an increase because they'll reduce you. Please understand that's a lie. If you go into those exams at a minimum doing everything you did the first time, you're not going to get decreased. Worst case scenario, they're going to say, no, you're the same level. Mm -hmm. But understanding how to do exams is so important. That's something that I will work with you on so that you know exactly what to expect when you go in. So the likelihood of getting decreased is wrong. So please ignore that. Okay. And then if you've not filed because you think you should not until you retire, my husband waited Seven years after the deployment to file and the VA denied his claim repeatedly. Mm -hmm. It took me six and a half years to get him service connected because they refused. The, 
The mindset is, if you really wanted this, you would have filed shortly after the deployment. So waiting that much time told them it's not legitimate. So don't wait until retirement. Let, let's get it in as soon as these things happen. Like if you get a line of duty, let's get right in and get it filed with the VA. When you're done with all the medical for the line of duty, then we work to transition you over. The VA is already in place and ready to go. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that we do VA at the same time. Yeah. No, that makes total so sense. So don't wait, yeah. please. Yeah, don't don't wait on that one. That's that's huge. I think I heard that coming off a uh, deployment. But once again, I was a 20 year old uh, uh, who thought, oh, uh, I'm I'm indestructible at that and point. Not so. possible to be broken when you're 20. Right, and that's yeah. I think what a lot of us think. So no, that's that's good information to add in there. <laughs> If you're interested in learning more, we can definitely put Annie's information in Thank the you. notes um, and her phone number, even though she said to email, we'll make sure that they're both in there. Thank you. If you like the video, uh, give it a like. If you have a question that we would, we can definitely pass on to Annie, mm -hmm. uh, put it in the comments. And uh, if you like the videos, uh, make sure to subscribe for future videos. Thanks. Hey, it's a pleasure. You bet.